Hi, everybody. Glad you're here today. And, uh, oh, if you're in Florida, uh, we're praying for you. And uh, just stay out of harm's way. Uh, these storms are very destructive in a number of ways. And we'll... Uh, be praying for everybody along the lines there. We're still dealing with the cleanup here in North Carolina, which is going to take months and months. I don't know even how they're going to do it all. But we're thankful for everything that the Lord has done for us. And uh, just keep praying that the Lord will continue to bless uh, in our ministries in Moriel. <clears throat> that people will be saved, that people will be discipled and help to grow. And that's what we're talking about today. Uh, we're going on to what's what I've called mature teaching part two. But the actual title is why were the grace gifts of servant leadership given? And it's taken from Ephesians 4, 11 through 16 it says this. It was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers, to prepare God's people for works of service, so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God, and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants, tossed back and forth, by the waves and blown here and there by every wave, every wind of, do of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of men in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into him who is the head, that is Christ. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. You know, now that we've established who modern day apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers are, let's move on to the main reason why these grace gifts of servant leadership are given. So let's step through the passage that I just read. First of all, to prepare God's work, God's people for works of service. First, the purpose of the grace gifts of servant leadership is to prepare God's people for works of service. If a person is not a servant himself, he won't know how to train others to be servants. Servants serve. They're not there to get others to serve them. We serve God first, then we serve others. False third wave teachers are haughty, uh, self-absorbed, self-proclaimed leaders who claim gifts from God yet use them to get themselves a title and to lord it over others. They have no idea how to be servants themselves. Therefore, they can't prepare anyone for works of service in the body of Christ or to preach the gospel to the world. True apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers use their grace gifts to serve in humility. The next part is so that the body of Christ may be built up. Now, this isn't talking about numbers or church size, church growth, or salvation statistics. It's talking about the spiritual body of Christ being built into a house. Ephesians 2.19, Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people, and members of God's household built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Jesus, with Christ Jesus himself as a chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple to the Lord. And in him too, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. This passage is talking about the same building, the church. It's a spiritual building, not a physical one. 
The Holy Spirit now dwells in the temple of the individual spirit of the true believer and in the body of Christ as a whole. As leaders, we're not to be concerned as much with quantity as with quality. We care what people believe, that they're believing the right thing, and that they walk in that belief. The reason for the grace gifts is not to build mega churches, but to build upon the foundation of Christ taught by the apostles and prophets. This means that those who have the grace gifts of servant leadership will be teaching sound doctrine as a basis for true unity. Titus 1.9 says he must hold firmly to the trustworthy message as it has been taught so that he can encourage others by sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it. In Titus 2.1 you must teach what is in accord with sound doctrine. Why is that? Well, the next part of the verse I read before, until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God. As we discussed in the previous chapter, unity is not referring to ecumenical unity. It's not talking about interfaith unity in dialogue. It's not even referencing the unity that we already share in the Holy Spirit by virtue of our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. We already have that as the body of Christ. So what kind of unity is this referencing? It's talking about unity in doctrine, unity in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. The whole purpose of the gifts is to bring about unity in the core doctrines of the faith, in the knowledge of God. You know what? That unity can be broken by heretics and divisive ones. This is why we are to reject divisive heretics because they cause disunity in the body of Christ. Titus 3.10, warn a divisive person once and then warn him a second time. After that, have nothing to do with him. The word for divisive in Greek is hereticos, from which we get the word heretic. A heretic is a person who teaches against the core doctrines of the faith. 2 Peter 2.1, but there are were also false prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. They will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the sovereign Lord who bought them, bringing swift destruction on themselves. And of course, Romans sixteen seventeen. I urge you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause divisions and put obstacles in your way that are contrary to the teaching you have learned. Keep away from them. You know, heresy causes divisions over the core doctrines and puts obstacles in the way of people to, for, from them to become mature, mature in the faith. And of course, that's what it says in the verse, and become mature. How can those with the grace gifts teach others to be mature if they themselves are not? What does becoming mature mean? It means growing from an infant to an adult spiritually. It means going from milk to solid food. It means growing in wisdom and knowledge of Jesus Christ. Hebrews 6.1 says, Therefore, let us leave the elementary teachings about Christ and go on to maturity. Colossians 1.10 and we pray this in order that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and may please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God. Hebrews 5, 13 through 15, anyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness. But solid food is for the mature, who by constant use, have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. Notice that those who are mature eat solid food, and that solid food trains them to distinguish good from evil. You know, infants cannot tell the difference. That's why many infant Christians can be so easily led astray by heretics. It's of vital importance for those in servant leadership to prepare the body of Christ to eat solid food 
so that they can stand against false teaching, false prophecy, and false anointings. Another part of what their job is, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Now, can any Christian be exactly like Christ? Well, you know, that's our goal, but while we're here on earth, we still have our old sin nature in the flesh and the mind and the temptations of the enemy to contend with. Of course, Jesus Christ was in the same situation as we are, but he never sinned. We will never be able to make that claim. Fortunately, however, we know that as we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, 1 John 1, 9. God the Father then no longer sees our unrighteousness, but sees the righteousness of his Son through the blood he shed for us. However, that doesn't mean we don't strive for maturity in Christ, to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. To, the, to do that, we must be crucified with Christ daily. Galatians 5.24, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and desires. Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Luke 9.23, then he said to them all, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. We no longer live for the desires of the flesh, but we live by faith in the Son of God. The perfect measure of the fullness of Christ will have its ultimate fulfillment when we're resurrected to eternal life. But there is also a fullness and abundant life to be experienced now as we are crucified with Christ and follow him. John 10.10, 10, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Ephesians 3.20-21, 20 now to him who is able to do Im uh, immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. We are saved by grace and it's also the power of the Holy Spirit working in us who can bring us to the fullness of Christ. We can't do that on our own. What we must do is submit to the Spirit, study and obey the Word, and stay in sound doctrine. 